Although Dean got good reviews, he wasn't the smash Frank was, but the two singers became good friends. Well, for starters, I think Frank offered to help Dean early on. And Dean told him that uh, he really appreciated it, and he did. But he really would like to have tried to make it more on his own. Making it on his own in New York was tough going at first. When gigs and money became scarce, Dean went back to one of his earlier professions, boxing. Only he wasn't fighting in Madison Square Garden. Dean told me that when he was young, that the way he made a living, a living, because he had no skill, was to invite people in a, in a hotel room and charge every person in there 50 cents, and then he and his friend would punch each other until one of them was knocked out. At the time, Dean was living with six other guys in one hotel room. One of them was an 18-year-old comic named Alan King. Dean was the leader. Dean was the leader, the troublemaker. Dean always made trouble for everybody. He'd start a rumor at one side of the room, then deny it on the other side of the room. And before the evening was over, everybody was fighting with everybody. Did he say that? Dean said, what are you asking me? I just walked in. Things started looking up when Dean landed a daily 15-minute local radio show. He even did screen tests for Columbia and MGM. But Hollywood wasn't interested. To them, he was just another Italian singer. And then, one afternoon in 1944, came a chance meeting with a young comedian named Jerry Lewis. Dean was staying at the Belmont Plaza. I was appearing at the Glass Hat of the Belmont Plaza. And we met in the coffee shop a couple of times. And his sense of humor and mine, we just kicked in. We became very, very friendly. Before long, Dean and Jerry often found themselves on the same bill. But performing together was the furthest thing from their mind. Then in the spring of 1946, they were both playing at New York's Havana, Madrid. One reviewer wrote that they had all the makings of a great act, but the two friends didn't pay attention. They were just kidding around. Who could make money doing that? So they continued to go their separate ways. And then a few months later, Jerry was booked into Skinny D'Amato's 500 Club in Atlantic City. The date was July 25th, 1946. And the singer that was on the show, a guy named Jack Randall, good singer, had a very bad case of laryngitis. And Skinny D'Amato asked me, who I thought should replace him. I said, Jesus, I got the best replacement in the world. My friend Dean Martin, who I think is in New York and he's not working. And Skinny said, nah, I don't want another singer. I said, but you don't, you don't, you don't understand something. He don't just sing. He and I do things together that's really good. He said, oh, okay. So he books Dean. Dean comes in the first night. He sings his three songs. I did my record act. And we're in the dressing room. Skinny came up and said, uh, where's all the funny things you guys were going to do? You either do them in the next show or you're both out of here. So I sat down and I wrote about 20 ideas. And Dean and I put it on its feet. The next show, we were on the stage two hours and 45 minutes. And the rest is history. You got a mess of stripes there. Yes, sir. When do you enlist? I threw in the war in 1925. <laughs> There was no war in 25. That's why I listened. Let's see. Right. Soon after Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis first teamed up, they became the talk of show business. The first night that Dean and I worked together, there were four people in the joint. But by the fourth night, you couldn't get into that club. I already finished. <laughs> but I want to fight the big dog war. The ring? It's big no more. You want to fight the ring? Well, why not? Well, it's against my religion. What's your religion? I'm a devout coward. <laughs> well, the appeal was that we... Not that we didn't care about the audience, but we never looked at the audience. We would work like I am talking to you now. We would work to each other. Get in the union band! I don't care about you or your union band. Oh! Oh! The young man they get? I'm I don't care if they get 19 and he's 29. And this wonderful balance between these two men, which was really the the love that we have for one another is what made that thing work. I'm warning you. No. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. I'm sorry. All right. Let's take it from Asia Minor. Here we go. Asia Minor. Dean and Jerry were quickly becoming known as the wildest act in the business. Maybe too wild for the more sophisticated clubs. 
But in the spring of 1948, they were booked into the most famous and classiest of them all, New York's Copacabana. With their smash success at the Copa, Dean and Jerry were officially in the big time. While still appearing at the club, they entered the new medium of television, making their TV debut on the very first Ed Sullivan show, and later were an even bigger hit on Milton Berle's Texaco Star Theater. And then they were off to Hollywood to play the town's top club, Slapsy Maxies. Opening night, the entire movie colony packed the place to see what all the shouting was about. They weren't disappointed. Then after our first show, about five producers came backstage and we signed a six-year contract with Hal Wallace. That's how fast things happened with Jerry and myself. Soon, all of America was introduced to the antics of Martin and Lewis with their first film, My Friend Irma. Hello, about Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis, the terrific new comedy team that'll lay him in the aisles? Yeah, Joe. Martin's the one who sings. See it in your smile, I hear it in your sigh That we have found a feeling higher than high My own, my only, my own What does Lewis do? A male seal, uh, a female seal, uh, both together, uh, uh, a baby seal uh. The offers kept pouring in for the team NBC signed them for a weekly radio show. It's the new, the great, the different, the Martin and Lewis show. Dean. Yeah? I'm scared. Look, we've done all right so far. We shouldn't be afraid. We did all right in nightclubs, didn't we? Yeah, but those people paid $10 cover charge so they, they had to like us. But at a radio show, the audience gets in free, and at those prices, they can afford to hate us. <laughs> they started recording for Capitol Records. And in between, Dean found the time to get married to Jeannie Biggers who he'd met while he and Jerry were appearing in the Orange Bowl parade. It was love at first sight. I was Orange Bowl queen, and he just followed the float. He was, I looked down, and there he was, was carrying, it was Christmas time, and he was carrying Christmas packages and just following the float. And I looked at him, and he looked at me, and I think that was, we decided that was kismet, that was it. That was a lockup. Martin and Lewis's schedule was so jam-packed the Dean and Jeannie's honeymoon was actually the publicity tour for my friend Irma. The new Mrs. Martin couldn't help but feel a little jealous of her husband's other partner. They just had more fun than anybody, I think. I, would, I envied the, them the, the good times that they had. And when they would work on stage, Dean and Jerry worked to each other. They made each other laugh. They would forget that there was an audience. And I think that's what made their act so extraordinary. Because, I mean, you would just... It was so contagious. The 70s 